Was this the craziest week in the history of spaceflight? There was so much happening, we just have to take a look back. So let's dive right in. All right, uh, lift off and the clock is started. Hey everyone, it's Tom June. The first week of June 2024 will be remembered in the annals of spaceflight as an astounding week, full of firsts and with more epic footage than we've ever had before. Up first, we had the Chang'e 6 mission from China, which was aiming to land its second spacecraft on the far side of the moon after Chang'e 4 in 2019, and return lunar samples to the Earth, something perfected with Chang'e 5. After a journey that lasted nearly a month, on the 1st of June, the lander detached from the orbiting module, and Chang'e 6 later touched down in the southern Mare of Apollo Basin, named after the crew of Apollo 8, who were the first humans to ever see the far side of the moon. Unlike in popular media, we don't call it the dark side of the moon, because, well, it's not dark at all, and receives nearly as much sunlight as the visible side of the moon, the one facing Earth. Once safely settled, the previously secretive small rover undocked and captured stunning images of the lander, which then drilled to a depth of around 2 metres below the regolith. With several kilograms of samples collected, they were safely deposited in the ascender stage, ready to head back up to the orbiter for its return to Earth. On the 3rd of June, the Ascender took off, leaving the lander, rover and remaining international scientific experiments to carry on with their jobs of gathering more data from the surface. The return module is expected to land back in Inner Mongolia around June the 25th, and those samples will no doubt provide the world scientists with years worth of valuable work analysing all of the composition. Also on the 1st of June, we had the second attempt to launch Boeing's Starliner crew capsule on ULA's Atlas V rocket. Things seemed to go smoothly from the first aborted attempt earlier in May, but with just three and a bit minutes left on the clock, the launch was scrubbed following an error with ground-based systems. There are multiple redundancies built into the software here, but it seemed that a ground-based launch sequencer card was running behind others in the system and forced a hold. That meant that the card had to be replaced, much to the dismay of the visibly frustrated Butch Wilmore. Still, just a few days later, and with schedules to keep to ensure future cargo resupply missions to the ISS weren't thrown out of alignment, on the 5th of June we were back on the pad for another attempt. There were no such issues this time as the count proceeded all the way down to terminal and then, at last, Starliner was off on its second trip to space carrying Butch and Sunny Williams. Always a great sight to see Atlas V blasting towards the sky and who knows how many more of these we will see as it's phased out for the all-American Vulcan Centaur. But the drama wasn't over yet as, just a few short hours into the flight, more problems surfaced, with helium leaks detected and thrusters failing. Ground teams worked frantically to patch the leaks, but problems kept coming as the onboard cooling system was found to be using more water than was nominal. As Starliner caught up with the space station, it was ordered to hold its approach, fearing that any problems affecting the ship could also affect the station. Engineers managed to patch the leaks and get several of the thrusters working, allowing Butch and Sunny to manually pilot the craft and safely dock to the ISS. Still, another helium leak was found shortly afterwards as ground teams continued to diagnose the problems. It's possible that the issues with the thrusters, which control the attitude of the ship in flight, was with software and not the hardware itself, meaning that the ship should be able to safely undock and return the crew home. Remember, this is still a test flight, and by its very nature, it means that issues are almost to be expected. Once it's back down though, inspections can take place to determine the root causes. Hopefully, it won't be too long before the next Starliner flight though, as it's of great benefit to NASA to have multiple crew-rated spacecraft capable of ferrying astronauts to and from the space station. That said, while we were all keeping one eye on the voyage of Butch and Sunny, the other was firmly on Starbase Texas, as SpaceX prepared for Starship's fourth integrated flight test. Yes, this was the big one. IFT-3 had been a big step forward for the Starship program, getting all the way to re-entry, 
but the next step was to test the booster's ability to perform a re-entry burn and soft landing in the ocean, while also testing Starship's heat shield, and then, if it made it through the atmosphere, whether it could land precisely in the ocean. Wow, a hefty manifest there. But the time then dawned, and on the morning, US time of the 6th of June, all 5,000 tonnes of Starship's awesomeness roared to life and lifted off from the OLM at Starbase. Yep, we were away again. One Raptor immediately shut down, leaving 32 still working, but that wasn't stopping this behemoth at all, though it may have been an early sign of things to come. Starship can afford to lose several engines during launch and still perform as needed, and just look at these incredible shots as it roared skywards. Soon, with Max-Q out of the way, the aerobatics commenced as ship and booster prepared for separation, with incredible views again from the onboard cameras. And then, yes, there we had it, successful separation and ignition of Starship's engines, allowing it to continue onwards to space. We also saw the jettison of the hot staging ring, something that won't be required on future iterations, but for this test, SpaceX wanted to reduce the mass of the booster just a touch. Thankfully, as planned, 13 Raptors reignited on the booster for the re-entry burn, shutting back down a short time later as the booster slammed its way into the upper atmosphere. Unlike on IFT-3, when the grid fins struggled to keep the booster stable, this time there was no such worries, and on hitting the thicker portions of the atmosphere, we saw that downward velocity cut right down. There appeared to be no worries for Starship as the vacuum engine shut down and it coasted high above. There was no in-space relight test for the engines, as that will be saved for another flight, but it looked as majestic as ever. Attention was soon back on the booster, though, with the big question. Could those Raptors reignite again for a soft, controlled landing? The whole point of this test was to simulate a future catch by the catch arms of the Mechazilla Tower at Starbase, so it needed to hit a precise location and not slam into the water below. Then, as it passed below 10 kilometers, we saw the booster come back to life. It appeared stable and always looking good. Then, multiple Raptors relit. Only 12 of the 13 successfully fired, with one engine appearing to destroy itself, sending debris flying past our camera view. But nothing was going to stop this booster from doing its job, and the remaining 12 brought the booster to an almost halt above the ocean, softly splashing down and shutting off as this 200-foot-plus beast toppled slowly and came to a rest. A job well done, and, as we later found out from Elon Musk, a safe, precise landing. Next, after the excitement of all that, it was back to Starship. After a short loss of video from the ship, everything was back working again, and we were treated to more awe-inspiring views from the fore and aft cameras mounted above the flaps, giving re-entry views in real time. IFT-3 was the first spacecraft to ever give us live views of re-entry as a spacecraft passed through the dense plasma created by the ship punching a hole in the atmosphere. But with IFT-4, just wow, truly spectacular here. Soon though, more drama as sparks began to fly from the front starboard flap. Telemetry data showed the ship still flying steadily as the altitude reduced, but it very quickly became apparent that hot gases were making their way through the flap hinge and burning through the outer skin of the flap. Teams were heard on the feed audibly groaning, and we all held our collective breaths. Could this flap withstand the immense heat of re-entry, or would the ship spin out of control and disintegrate? Well... Despite chunks of debris smashing into the camera, we could make out that the flap was amazingly not only still somewhat intact, but actually working, and Starship passed lower and lower, descending upon the Indian Ocean. Oh my god, this was crazy to watch in real time. Ship orientation was still good, but the next question... As with the booster, would those raptors fire back up and allow the ship to transfer from the belly flop into an upright orientation for landing? And wouldn't you believe it, against all the odds, and with that forward flap clinging on for dear life, the ship reorientated itself. 
Telemetry data didn't show the engines alight, but there was no doubting it, as we saw the flames on screen and velocity cut right down with Starship landing safely before coming to rest in the ocean and that flap, that hero flap, finally breaking off. Cheers came from the team at Hawthorne and it was a job well done for booster and ship. IFT-4 was a massive success, despite all the problems it faced along the way. It just goes to show how well they are built, how redundancies are supposed to work, and how much further they have come since IFT-1 just over a year ago. With only a few days to rest up, on the 8th of June we were then treated to another flight by Virgin Galactic on their 7th VSS Unity suborbital flight carrying three paying passengers, as well as Turkish astronaut Tuva Atasiver and crewed by Commander Nikola Pesel and pilot Jamil Janjua. As said, this was Unity's final flight as it's retired to make way for the newer Delta class ship due to roll out in 2026. It was a flight almost completely overshadowed by Starship, Starliner and Chang'e 6, but it was another successful showing for Virgin Galactic as crew and passengers touched down safely around an hour after launch. Also overshadowing it was the sad news that on the 7th of June 2024, Apollo 8 astronaut Bill Anders, the man who captured the stunning Earthrise photographs from that flight, humanity's first around the moon alongside Jim Lovell and Frank Borman, had passed away in a flying accident. At 90 years old, he was still flying aerobatics in his single-seat aircraft, showing that age was not to defy him after a life spent in similar pursuits. He was a member of NASA's third astronaut group and also studied radiation effects, as well as being one of the first to test the lunar landing training vehicle, LLTV, alongside Neil Armstrong. He was also part of the backup crew for Apollo 11 and later became Executive Secretary of the National Aeronautics and Space Council and advocated for the continuation of Skylab as well as a smaller space shuttle so that space research wasn't just confined to one low Earth orbit program. He enjoyed a career in the private sector, becoming an assistant test pilot for the F-16 before retiring in 1994 and carrying out charitable work through the William A. Anders Foundation. An incredible career and life of someone who gave humanity an awe-inspiring glimpse at itself with a photograph that was heard around the world. I know the whole spaceflight community sends their deepest condolences to the Anders family, who can be assured that his legacy will live on through to eternity. So, this may not be part of my usual UK-focused content here, but it was a week jam-packed with the highest of highs and lowest of lows in spaceflight. If you want to stay up to date with more incredible space news, remember to hit that subscribe button and consider becoming a supporter of the channel. Thank you to my amazing Patreon supporters, without whom I wouldn't be able to continue doing this. Thank you all for watching, I've been Tom June, and I'll catch you next time.